Hello, my name is Andrew Collins and I'm a telly addict. Well, it's all about Game of Thrones, isn't it? With our own world in financial collapse, political atrophy and nuclear peril, it doesn't take a symposium of sociologists to understand why TV's ubiquitous period dramas, history plays and fantasy epics appeal so desperately right now. And Game of Thrones, set in this vast wilf-lung map of Westeros, a continent at war in quasi-medieval times, does the trick on so many levels. The only downside to the third season from HBO arriving here almost simultaneously on Sky Atlantic is that a law-abiding citizens of this blighted ancient land who don't have Sky can't see it, and B, if you're new to all this, it's going to be nigh on impossible to catch up. It was David Simon, creator of The Wire, who, when asked about the show's impenetrability to casual viewers, said, F the casual viewer. Game of Thrones, which is a bit like The Wire, but on a continental rather than civic scale, takes this belligerent remit to the bridge. These clips may, like Vienna to Midjur, mean nothing to you. Not having read George R. R. Martin's source novels, I keep my laptop open at the Wikipedia character guide at all times. And I've been watching since day one. I sent you here to advise the king. I gave you real power and authority. And you chose to spend your days, as you always have, bedding harlots and drinking with thieves. Occasionally I drank with the harlots. What do you want, Tyrion? Why does everyone assume I want something? For the record, that was Charles Dance, relishing every syllable of calculating Tywin Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, Shield of Lannisport, Warden of the West, and recently reinstalled Hand of King Joffrey. And the impeccable Peter Dinklage as the Imp, or Tyrion Lannister, Tywin's cunning son and former Hand. I may as well just be opening and closing my mouth now for the uninitiated, but don't worry, I'll be doing the Great British Sewing Bee in a bit. Find her a chamber that will serve as a cell. Vast narrative canvas aside, what GOT's really about is family, succession, loyalty, betrayal, the usual stuff we deal with at Christmas, except with swords and armies and castle keeps. She's your mother. She freed Jamie Lannister. The Lannisters robbed them of their sons. She robbed them of their justice. It's HBO, so as well as surf-like allegiance from its parish newspaper, The Guardian. You can expect gratuitous sex, I've never had much imagination. And gratuitous violence. Tell the good master there is no need. But although the books and this magnificent, stately, involving, intelligent, sinewy televisual tribute are categorised as fantasy, it prioritises human beings, many of them bluff English northerners and one of them called Rob, over hobbits and wizards. In fact, there are only three little dragons, oh, and one giant. Last time we've seen a giant, Jon Snow. Yes, that character's called Jon Snow. That's Channel 4 News. Good evening. If it makes the sky intolerant feel any better, Game of Thrones was born to be watched on box set in 10 hour binges. The rest of us poor saps are reduced to watching each new episode a number of times to fill in the weekly void. But, like Mad Men, which is also back to haunt us this week, it improves with each viewing. So, back to hard reality. <laughs> Far, far away from the dynastic struggles of the Seven Kingdoms, BBC Two attempted to further exploit the make-do-and-mend austerity nostalgia of breadline Britain by filling an obvious gap in the market – competitive needlework. The Great British Sewing Bee has been run up from the same pattern as MasterChef and The Bake Off, except instead of amateur cooks, it's home seamsters and seamstresses. Why? We're going to needlework classes and sewing circles are popping up all across the country. So we're launching the first ever search for Britain's best home sewer. Fair enough, Claudia. I'm sure that's all statistically true. But does sewing have the same pan-clattering, bernet-splitting, sweaty brow drama as cooking? So who will cut? Panic. Just sheer panic. Stitch. Oh, I've got it in the wrong way. Coming out again, coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out. And iron their way to victory. I don't care, and I mean that in the nicest possible way. I can appreciate a nicely cut trouser. I actually learned how to thread a bobbin in sewing classes at a co-educational middle school. And I even quite enjoy ironing. But dressmaking just isn't a spectator sport, is it? It's time to give you your first challenge. 
we'd like you all to make the same item of clothing and it's an A-line skirt. May's going to hand out the patterns. I left them to it at this point. Makeover shows like Changing Rooms might have retrained us to watch paint dry, but even I don't stretch to watching skirts ironed. They'll win the job of their dreams. Here's another new reality format that's conversely short of material. The Intern is Channel 4's blatant land grab for the glory of The Apprentice. Its twist is that instead of showcasing the self-aggrandizing talents of 90s entrepreneurs with the prize of a rhetorical job at an 80s electronics firm, it humiliates desperate jobless people. For unemployed graduate Princess, part-time waiter Taylor and young mum Georgia, it's the opportunity of a lifetime. On the face of it, the intern appears to offer valuable on-the-job training for three young people struggling to find full-time work. Strivers by insidious definition. Princess believed her degree in business management would make it easy to get a good job. Since graduation, I've been trying hard. I've been applying for HR roles, marketing roles. I just feel like, oh my gosh, I've had so many interviews and it's just... That's the point. And good on them for having the common sense to apply for the intern, on which they get free advice from haulage magnet, ex-dragon and Coronation Street ready matriarch Hilary DeVay. She was so bold saying, I want to be a manager and that is my ambition. That is exactly the aspiration and desire I'm looking for in our youngsters. Seems a decent, timely enough tweak of an established format and episode one put its first batch of YTS hopefuls to work in a posh London hotel. But then it turned, without warning, into Beatles about. So while she's busy making beds on the fourth floor, she's blissfully unaware that downstairs, Hilary set up a surprise for her. TV star Hugo Taylor from Made in Chelsea has been planted in a very compromising position. First of all, I was hoping not to have to see anyone off that wretched programme ever again. And secondly, are these elaborate pranks designed to test the interns or entertain the rest of us? Poor kid. He's parked an expensive car for a guest and it's being towed away. And he's not old enough to remember Beatles about. What's happening with this car? Uh, we parked out of the Mark Bay in Council of Sunnerstand to pick it up. But hey, even though the show itself mainly disguises mean-spiritedness as largesse, one intern did seem to get on the hotel chain's management training course at the end of it. Adjust the figures, George. I must admit, I was happy to see the return of the nostalgic clip show I Love 1914. Where are we? The summer of 1914. <laughs> the summer the bus came. This was the framing device for The Village on BBC One from writer Peter Moffat, who's usually cranking out high-flying, fast-talking legal dramas. His idea for this is blindingly brilliant. Tell the story of the last century without stepping foot outside a single fictional Peak District hamlet, where visitors are always assured of a warm working-class welcome. Why do you say hello to me? Well, I want to... What do you want? Who are you? John Sim there as the saga's family guy, father of the old geezer Bert who frames the series, which runs for six episodes to begin with, but which, in Moffat and the BBC's dreams, will run for 42. Let's hope it cheers up a bit. Nineteen years old. You're stunned. You never asked me, Mother. Did you get round? Three sides on my own. And the sheathing? Actually, after the airs and graces of Downton, it's quite exhilarating to be reminded of what life was really like in the olden days, when internships weren't for the likes of us, and Welfare UK was well unfair UK. Mind you, it was all fields, and director Antonia Bird allowed us to drink in scenery that didn't need drawing in afterwards on a laptop. And nobody had left the village in 100 years. With a cast topped by the full-blooded Sim and a windswept Maxine Peake, and filled out with gem-like youngsters from a Nottingham TV workshop, the village already boasts a callous realism. And for anyone yearning for a bit of smooth, there's Juliet Stevenson's Lady in the Big House. Good afternoon, Miss Lane. We were discussing the mole catcher problem. Well, ask Joe. He'll know. Joe! Why do moles?
Cole catches die. Strychnine. Joe should know, the last time we saw him he was a footman on Upstairs Downstairs. So far the village is like one of those 1990s Catherine Cookson adaptations in HD. But if Moffat gets to see his Derbyshire high map through 100 years, it might at some point look like this. Status is status quo on my end. I'm supposed to have drinks with Bruce Lewis from Oldsmobile. He wants to know if there's a way around Nader. There isn't. Anything else? That was season 5, season 6 next week. To finish, scenes we'd like to see on television. Hilary DeVay is giving three young hopefuls the chance of getting their dream job at one of Britain's top hotel chains.